distinguished guests, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my pleasure and honor to welcome you to the very, very first Econopolis Chair Lecture. A lecture today that will be completely dedicated to computer-mediated transactions and the different ways in which computer mediation does already, can, will impact economic activity. After the events of this week and yesterday's news, there seems to be no better moment than the present to at least start the debate about the implications of digital applications. Dear colleagues and guests, um, I would like to first of all express my sincere appreciation to our keynote speaker of today, Hal Varian, Professor Varian, dear Hal. Um, we are very pleased, I'm very pleased, that you were willing to accept the invitation to give this very first of what hopefully will become a long series of inspirational and well, uh, stimulating lectures, the Econopolis Chair lectures, lectures that always, also in the future, will deal with the dramatic changes in our economic landscape, the most provocative socioeconomic issues in our society, and of course their effect on corporate dynamics, business model innovation, and sustainable growth. So thank you, Hal, to accept this invitation for the first lecture, uh, the first Econopolis lecture. In particular, I also would like to welcome the Econopolis team. Um, the Econopolis directors, the managers, the partners, of course, the external partners, the, um, the analysts, uh, with, of course, a special mention to Geert Noels, Geert Wellens, and Urbain van Deurzen. Um, Urbain, Geert, and Geert, the Econopolis chair gives us a very important opportunity to learn from uh, intense collaboration with a team of external experts external specialists, but also gives the, and that's very important for us, the financial means to further deepen the research in our faculty, in our school, into the long-term persistence of corporate growth, the segments and the industries where such growth is to be expected, the features of hidden champions in our economy and their importance in terms of job creation. Thank you for the support through this chair, through granting this chair. Thank you for the confidence that you have placed in us and to the openness that you show in sharing your ideas, sharing your thinking with us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today I'm just the uh, master of ceremonies. I'm your host. That's my only role today. Um, I'm at the same time also a co-shareholder, co so it's, uh, I'm a co-promoter of the Econopolis uh, chair. But I must say, well, one of the very, very few privileges of being dean is that you also have sometimes at least the power to delegate the real hard work to others. And I will, I have to admit that uh, the real hard work in the context of this chair is, um, carried out by Joop Konings, my dear colleague Joop Konings, the co-shareholder and his research team. So that is why I am so, well, so kind to leave the honor of introducing to do today's keynote speaker uh, to Joop. Um, and as you will notice, Joop's uh, introduction will be not just, um, let's say, um, summary of what Hal Varian has published in the past, of all his accomplishments, but will all at the same time be a real tribute to what we consider to be an impressive academic career. Yeah. And of course also a um, real laudatio for what Halvarian has meant for research in especially the area of microeconomics and still means today as a chief economist at Google. Yup, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Dear Mr. Vice President, Mr. Dean, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and dear Professor Varian. 
I have the honor and privilege to introduce today's lecture of Professor Hal Varian. To many of us, Professor Varian is known as a handbook, Varian Microeconomics, or Varian Intermediate Micro. Indeed, most undergraduate and graduate programs in economics and business use this very clear and accessible textbook to educate and train many generations of young economists, many of whom turn to do leading scholars in economics and management. Of course, Professor Varen has not only left behind a legacy of educating many generations of economists, but more importantly, his path-breaking work is leaving behind a legacy about the way we are thinking about economic problems, which provides a guide to managers, economists, and policy, policy makers for better decision making. Highly important, I would say, especially in the current age of big data and information technology. Professor Varian started his academic career at the MIT. He then spent almost 20 years at the University of Michigan before moving to Berkeley. Since 2007, but actually earlier, Professor Varian is the chief economist of Google. And this is no coincidence. Professor Varian's important contributions in various areas of economics going from typical macro, not micro, but macroeconomic topics such as inflation and business cycles, to applied microeconomic subjects such as price discrimination and consumer behavior make him an all-round economist delivering key novel insights in various fields of economics and management. Already since the early 1990s, Professor Varian started to publish on the economics of the internet. Clearly back then, a non-typical topic to conduct research on, but obviously highly visionary. In this context, Professor Varian, with his colleague Carl Shapiro, published a very important and influential book, Information Rules, a Strategic Guide to the Network Economy. In contrast to what many people these days claim that in the age of big data, economic models are no longer a useful guide, Professor Varian argues in this book that many classic economic concepts can provide the insight and understanding necessary to succeed in the information age. If managers and policymakers seriously want to develop effective strategies for competing in the new economy, they must understand the fundamental economics of information technology. Professor Varian, for your important contributions to the field of economics and management, the University of Leuven would like to offer you a special distinction. In particular, the executive committee of the Humanities and Social Sciences Group has created the KU Leuven Medal of Honor in the Humanities and Social Sciences, in Dutch, Erepenning Humane Wetenschappen. The Medal of Honor is awarded to laureates of exceptional academic and social distinction and to make a unique contribution to the mutual relationship between faculties and universities. I would like, therefore, at this stage, to invite our Vice, Vice President, Professor Danny Peters, to give this Medal of Honor. Professor Peters. Great, thank you very much. And so now I'm very proud to uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Varian and to listen to what you've all been waiting for, the title of his lecture of today, Computer Mediated Transactions. Professor Varian, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that kind introduction, and what a surprise to get this uh, wonderful medal. And I also see there's a cake there, too, so it's all, something for everyone. Uh, that's for after the lecture. Uh, that's for after the lecture. I, I get the medal before, and then if it's a good lecture, I get some cake. Okay, so thank you again. That's, uh, that's very nice of you and uh, very gracious. Uh, I thought I would start um, by telling a little story it's a story about a rector, I guess, who uh, wanted to evaluate his faculty, so he decided to give them 
a puzzle and see who was best at solving this particular puzzle. So the puzzle he devised was to give a challenge to the faculty members. There was a physicist, there was a chemist, and there was an economist. And the challenge was to give them each a barometer that measures air pressure. And he said, I want you to use this barometer to measure the height of that building over there. So the physicist said, ah, it's nothing, it's so easy. Went over the building, took the elevator to the top, threw the barometer off of the building and timed its descent to the ground. Did a simple calculation and revealed the height of the building. The next challenge was to the chemist. I would like you to measure the height of this building. Easy, he said. He went to the building, looked at the air pressure on the barometer, took the elevator to the top, looked at the air pressure again, and used those two numbers to calculate the height of the building. Finally, he gave the last barometer to an economist. He said, I want you to use this barometer to determine the height of the building. The economist said, no problem. He went, he found the janitor, he said, I'll give you this nice barometer if you tell me how tall your building is. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, economists deal with incentives in many ways, and what I want to do is tell you some interesting things you can do with data. Maybe not quite as interesting as uh, measuring the heights of buildings, but at least uh, something that I think you'll find interesting and entertaining this afternoon. So, I want to start with the idea of computer-mediated transactions. The idea there is that there's a computer in the middle of almost all economic transactions. And because you have that computer in the middle, that enables certain kinds of activities that were difficult to do, or in some cases impossible, without the computer. So the four categories I want to discuss are one, data extraction and analysis. And we've heard a lot about that these days. That's the big data story, that you can use the data that's generated, recorded, and captured by this computer in order to have interesting insights about the transaction. I'll give you some examples, many examples, in a, in a few minutes. Second thing you can do is personalization and customization. So you don't have to have one size fits all because the computer can generate information about the parties in the transaction and customize that transaction in ways that are beneficial to uh, one or both or more of the parties in the transaction. Now those are pretty well known today. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those two. But the third and fourth items are, I think, relatively novel. Third item is experimentation and continuous improvement. So the idea is not only can the computer be there to watch the transaction, to record information about the transaction, to customize it for the parties involved, but it can also actually conduct experiments to vary the transaction and see how the transaction is improved or uh, not improved by these uh, variations. So you can build up a kind of continuous learning system that is helping to improve uh, the performance of the system that you're uh, examining. And finally, the last one is contractual innovation. That's in some ways the most interesting. I'll save that to the end. But that says that if the computer uh, is in the middle of the transaction, it can uh, enforce or enable contracts that were otherwise uh, you were not able to implement because the computer could observe things that were previously unobservable and thereby allow contractual innovation that was not possible before. That sounds a little abstract, but I'm going to give you some specific examples in a few minutes. So let's start with the data extraction and analysis, the big data story. This is a picture of the initial claims for unemployment benefits. So the initial claims for unemployment benefits, if you became unemployed in the US, you would go down to your local office and you would file to receive unemployment benefits. That's the black line in those pictures. The gray bars are recessions, the black lines are the initial claims, and then the red line is the actual unemployment rate. So you should think about water flowing into a sink, that's like people becoming unemployed, water flowing out of the sink, that's like people getting jobs, and the level of water in the sink is the unemployment rate. So as you can see, there's a kind of nice pattern there. If we look at the initial claims, the black line 
it peaks right at the end of every recession. So you say, isn't that fantastic? Economists can predict the ends of recession by just looking at that uh, initial claims to unemployment. Well, that's true, but the little secret that we don't like to reveal is economists get to define when a recession ends, and one of the things they look at is the initial claims for unemployment benefits. It's a very good indicator. So more importantly, the initial claims are also a good predictor of when the unemployment rate peaks, usually six to eight weeks after, uh, 68 months after the peak of the uh, initial claim. So it's a very closely watched uh, mechanism. Now, let's think about what one would do if you became unemployed. Uh, well, you, as I said, you would go to the unemployment office and file for benefits, but where is the unemployment office? How long, what hours are it's open? What papers do you need to bring? What's the process like? How long would it take? So how would you answer those questions? Of course, you would go to Google, and you would say, where's the unemployment office, what are the hours, all these different things. So that means that we can look at the Google queries, the searches that people are doing on Google related to uh, unemployment benefits, and those would be a good predictor of what the actual claims filings look like. And indeed, if we go to this nice tool, Google Trends, I uploaded the initial claims to unemployment benefits to uh, Google Trends, the NSA stands for Non-Seasonally Adjusted, and uh, then I said, what queries are most correlated with this time series I just uploaded? And the answer was Michigan unemployment, Idaho unemployment, Pennsylvania unemployment, unemployment filing, and so on. The reason for the state names is the programs are all administered by the states. So what you could do then is you could take the data on queries searches and use that as a predictor for the actual filing for initial claims. And here's what the picture looks like. Initial claims are the blue line, and the red line is the query volume on unemployment filing. So you can see there's a very, very strong uh, correlation there. And we can build a little model. So the econometric model would be the initial claims today depend on the initial claims last week the initial claims 52 weeks ago, and an error term. So a simple autoregressive model, seasonal autoregressive model with, uh, with order one. And you can compare that to a baseline uh, forecast that just involves the time series itself, uh, what the initial claims looked like last week and 52 weeks ago. And when you add in that extra predictor using the Google uh, Trends data, you find that the R squared goes from about 80.8 percent .8 to 87.6 percent, about a 10 percent improvement in the goodness of fit. So having that extra information is very helpful, and you know that information weeks before the data is actually released, because you can look at the Google data, which I just described, is available with just an hour lag, and, and the initial claims are reported uh, weekly with about a 10 days uh, lag. So it's really helpful in terms of getting not really a forecast of the initial claims, but a now cast, okay? A now cast when you're looking at what the claims look like now. And in many cases with economic data, there's a long reporting lag, uh, a month in some cases, three quarter, uh, a quarter or three months for uh, GDP. And so it's very helpful to get a picture of the current state of the economy by looking at these kinds of uh, indicators. Now that's a fairly simple example. I just use correlation to choose my predictor. But you might ask, how can you make this variable selection easier? If I were looking at something like consumer confidence, that might also be correlated with the kinds of queries that people are issuing. Or if you looked at vacation planning, again, that would be a similar example. And with big data, for all the talk about big data that you see in the newspapers, they don't make a fundamental, or they usually fail to make a fundamental distinction. Namely, do you have a lot of rows of data, a lot of observations on different units, or do you have a lot of columns of data, a lot of features about those units that you might not have otherwise? For economics, especially this kind of time series economics, we usually have a fairly short series 100 or 150 observations, but we may have a lot of possible predictors. 
in this case, as uh, with the example with initial claims. So the question is, you've got a wealth of possible predict predictors. How do you choose the ones that are going to be the most helpful in building an economic model? You can use simple correlation. That's what I used a few minutes ago. You can use human judgment, your perceptions about which ones are going to be the most useful. You can use statistical techniques like uh, stepwise regression, or you can use machine learning techniques like lasso and LARS, elastic net, these uh, various variable selection models that have come from uh, the machine learning literature. We use something called a spike and slab regression. The idea there is you have a Bayesian model where there's some probability that a variable is included in your model, and then conditional on the inclusion, you have a prior distribution on what coefficient value that uh, variable takes on. We combine that with a common filter, and we build up a system that we refer to as Bayesian structural time series. This was work done with my colleague, Steve Scott. Uh, we prepared this in a uh, package that you can download from the our uh, archives, and then use that to do your own model building. Uh, what I want to show you today are not the details of the statistical methodology, which is available in a couple papers uh, on my Berkeley website, but I want to talk about some of the interesting applications that you can do using this particular data. I'm going to illustrate it primarily using Google data, but you can use this in any, any model, any uh, circumstances where you want to do uh, variable selection. So here's an example, new home sales. So we can look at new home sales in the US. I go to one of the archives for economic data, download the new wholesale, uh, the new home sales, feed that into this uh, tool, Google Correlate, and Google Correlate comes back with the 100 queries that are most highly correlated with the series I entered on new home sales. And I don't know how well people can see the uh, text there, but the number one predictor, number one predictor for new home sales turns out to be something called Tahitian Nani juice. So this illustrates that even with these sophisticated statistical methods, it's still possible to get spurious correlation. Uh, there's no guide, uh, there's no substitute for using human judgment here. If you go look at it, this was a particular food or drink that became popular right about the time that new home sales spiked during the uh, housing boom and became unpopular just about the same time it ended. And uh, there's no particular reason why Tahitian Nani juice would help predict uh, housing sales. But if you look down the list a little bit, things start looking better. There's 80-20 mortgage, appreciation rate, home appreciation, help you sell, new home builder, lots of real estate related terms. And it seems like those terms or terms related to them would be helpful in trying to uh, get a now cast of what home sales look like. And indeed, here I look at 80-20 mortgage, where you go get a mortgage for your real estate purchase uh, how it's correlated with the actual new home sales, and you can see there's a very, very strong relationship between those two variables. So what we do is just download the data from Google Correlate. We take those 100 highly correlated queries, and we say, let's build the best model that we can build based on those 100 queries using the variable selection technique that I described earlier. And here's what we find, the number one predictor the, the predictor that is, has the highest probability of inclusion turns out to be appreciation rate, which somebody might be concerned about if they were buying a new house, particularly in a period when house prices were rising rapidly. IRS 1031, that's a particular form that you file if you want to uh, have a particular tax treatment of your purchase. Century 21 realtors, real estate purchase, 80-20 mortgage, selling real estate, etc. So what those bars indicate are the probability of inclusion of this variable in the model that you're building. And in fact, when I say the model, I should be a little more specific. Actually, you're building thousands of models. You're sampling thousands of models and looking at how often each of these variables are included in the model. That's what you're using to make the uh, final uh, prediction. 
And uh, if you want to visualize what this looks like, you can take the model, which is based on a trend component, a seasonal component, and then these predictors that I just described, and plot each of those things separately. What happens if you include just a trend? What happens if you include the trend plus the seasonal? The trend plus the seasonal pl plus the first predictor, second predictor, third predictor, and so on. And here's what it looks like. The blue dots are the new home sales. The red line is the trend component. The little colored bars at the bottom are the residuals, the difference between the, the actual and the fitted. We add the seasonal component, which shows you the seasonality in housing, which you are familiar with, I'm sure. We add in the appreciation rate, the IRS 1031, Century 21 Realtor, real estate of purchase, and you see just with those three or four predictors, you get this uh, extraordinarily good fit. Now, of course, as you all know, I'm cheating a little bit here because I'm just looking at the in-sample fit. If you really want to get a good idea of what your model is doing from a forecasting point of view, you have to look at the out-of-sample fit. So on the next slide here, I've plotted the actual uh, time series, the time series using just a simple autoregression model, and then the time series using these extra predictors from the Google Trends, doing a one step ahead forecast, where I'm trying to say, as of month T, how well can you forecast T plus one, and roll through the data to get a uh, forecasting model. Here we get about a 23% uh, improvement by including those extra predictors. So it's a pretty definitely helpful in terms of forecasting what uh, housing sales look like. Now that was an example looking across time to try to forecast the time series. You can use the same uh, general approach to look at the uh, forecasts across space, across different geographies. Uh, so you can take queries or query categories, depends on the application, and see what's predictive of some variables distribution across uh, geographic areas. Now this has been done for many years in many different social sciences. You'll have, let's say, census data, and you'll try to run a regression relating the variable of interest against the census characteristics to see how well you can predict using variables like education and uh, gender and uh, uh, income, wealth, other variables of this sort. But here, instead of restricting ourselves just to those census variables, we have a whole other set of indicators, namely the kind of queries that emanate from a particular geographic location. So we're not doing anything at the individual level. We're just looking at groups of people, but we're looking at sometimes states or counties or uh, individual metros that allow you to uh, see the relationship between characteristics of the population and the particular variable you're interested in. So as an example of this, the New York Times constructed an index of hard places. They looked at income, education, health, several other indicators of this sort, and identified those places where these indicators look bad. Low education, low income, bad health outcomes, and so on. Constructing an index of hard places to live. That's what it looked like, the gold uh, areas are in fact the places where people had bad values of these uh, particular metrics. The green places are where they had good values for those particular metrics. So you can see in the south of the U.S., uh, the rural south, up through the Midwest, what we call the Rust Belt sometimes, you can see this kind of, uh, of uh, poor or underprivileged areas. So the question then is what kinds of queries help predict the value of this index, the index of hard places to live. And if we look at places that are really low in these socioeconomic metrics, the uh, most predictive query is social, sorry, uh, uh, social security disability, people where there are a lot of queries on how do you get a disability claim. Or if you look at uh, free diabetic, that's the second uh, most probable predictor and uh, ways to lower blood pressure. These are generally things that are associated with what we call lifestyle diseases, obesity, 
blood pressure, diabetes, and so on. And just using those queries, just using a very simple model based on the frequency of occurrence of those queries, you get really quite a good fit uh, in terms of uh, these hard places to live. So here's the, well, I guess I'm not really predicting very well. Uh, these are the, uh, the places where you uh, can find that association is the strongest. What about good places to live, places that uh, have high income, good health, etc.? There, it turns out the leading predictor is solo 401k, which is a retirement plan that would be used for just a single participant. So this is the kind of thing that a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist would use for setting up their uh, particular retirement plan. And the next query that's most highly predictive turns out to be a number for a particularly popular digital camera. So it was something that was a little hard to identify, but it was very indicative of where you had high incomes, high socioeconomic status, high education, and I guess high interest in, uh, in photography. Customization and personalization. Not only can you look at data and uncover these patterns, these interesting patterns using the uh, query data, you could also look at uh, questions that are help you resolve particular issues that are relevant to those uh, areas or people who live in those areas. So here's an example. This is a nice uh, business example. A mobile phone maker came to us and said, you know, we have the only mobile phone that's designed, engineered, and assembled in America. Should we advertise that? And my response was, well, maybe, but maybe that's going to be a very important consideration of some areas and not so much important in others. So the first idea is let's run a survey. So we ran a survey that said, I prefer to buy products that are assembled in America. And this is a little histogram of people who strongly agree, agree, or neutral, and so on. But along with the survey responses from this particular tool that we use to, uh, that we use for conducting the survey, we also had the geographic uh, location of the respondent who responded to the survey. So that was done at a city level. So we could use the same tool that we just used. We could take the responses to this survey, a couple thousand people, we could find out what queries are most predictive of the survey response. We called this um, survey amplification because we could look not only at the actual data, we could also look at correlates of that that were helpful in understanding the characteristics of the places that were uh, strongly uh, felt strongly about this uh, assembled in America. So here's what they are uh, using the same model I just described. Places where a lot of queries on Chevrolet, firearms and weapons, country music, and trucks were areas where this was a uh, very strong consideration for the survey respondents. You can draw your own conclusions about where those uh, areas are. And in fact, if you look at the cities where this was a very important consideration for people. There were small towns in South Carolina, West Virginia, 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 North Carolina, and so on. And you look at the places where these was not of strong consideration. Those were areas in California, Fremont, Mountain View, San Jose, Berkeley, Redmond, Washington, and so on. So you get a strong picture of where this message resonates with people and where it doesn't necessarily resonate. And if you were conducting your ad campaign, obviously you would want to conduct this ad campaign in the areas where it would strongly resonate with the respondents. We did a very similar thing at the time this, uh, this uh, survey was undertaken. This particular company had the only smartphone that could be customized to your own preferences with respect to the color and the trim and these sorts of matters. We ran a survey I would like to be able to choose the color of my mobile phone. And there the responses were completely the opposite. It was cities with young people with a lot of fashion queries. Uh, it was part particularly important consideration among women. And you could get a model that was a quite different population. So you, you would want to advertise that feature of your product in the areas where uh, that 
message resonated with the population. So a nice tool for targeting your uh, ad campaigns. And here's the picture of what the Assembled in America uh, looked like for the original question of when that was important to people's uh, consideration. So again, you can see it goes through the South and the uh, industrial Midwest. Those are the places that would be most attractive from the viewpoint of this advertising uh, choice. Experimentation and continuous improvement. So this is a very uh, interesting uh, way that you can use computer mediation because the little secret that people don't tell you about machine learning is machine learning is primarily a way for looking for patterns in the data, but it doesn't really say anything about causality, about whether this uh, particular variable, say advertising, actually impacts the choices that people make. Now George Box, a statistician, made a simple but profound statement, namely to find out what happens when you change something, it's necessary to change it. You can't just infer causality from looking at purely observational data. There should be something that moves the variable in question to see whether it has an impact on some other variable in the model. So uh, here's how you can view this uh, problem with observational data. We could take a simple regression model that said some outcome, maybe that's purchases of a product, depend on uh, some marketing variable, X, and then some unobserved variables, okay? Things that you don't observe, things that are in the error term. And the correlation question says, if you observe a certain value of X, what's a good prediction for Y? Okay, so you observe X, what's a good prediction for Y? The causality question is quite different. It says, what happens to Y as you change X? As you s explicitly intervene and move X around, how does Y respond? Now there's this concept in statistics we call a confounding variable or a confounder. It's something unobserved that affects both X and Y at the same time. And when you have those confounders, you have a big problem because you don't necessarily, uh, you can't really infer a causal relationship between X and Y in the presence of those confounding variables. So example, how do you know your advertising works? Well, says the marketing manager, every December I increase my spending on ads and guess what, every December my sales go up, okay? Now, there's an obvious confounder there. I've drawn a picture of retail sales, and you can see they have this very, very strong seasonality. The confounding variable in this case is, well, there's the holiday season when people give gifts, and that's going to affect both your ad spend and your sales, so you can't isolate that independent causal effect of how changing ad spend affects sales. Christmas holidays are the obvious confounder. In this particular case, since we have a pretty good idea of where the problem lies, we can just include that as a predictor and then uh, maybe hope that we have uh, a, a causal model. But what happens if you can't observe it? Because there's lots of other things that could affect both your choice of ad spend and your uh, outcome that you're interested in. So how can we deal with that uh, problem in this context? Well, you have to do some kind of experiment. You have to do something that actually moves X and you can look at the response and Y. So the way we do that is we think of training a model, one of the predictive models that I've just been discussing, using historical data, and then we test that model on some holdout. We see how well this model works in predicting the out-of-sample behavior. We then apply the treatment, that could be the ad spend or whatever uh, context we're looking at, and we can look at the observed outcome compared to what the model predicted would have happened if there were no application of the marketing ad spend. Okay, so we want to look at the counterfactual, what would have occurred according to our predictive model if there was no intervention. Here's a picture, in this particular case, the actual time series is in black, whereas the red is the predicted time series. So we build a model during this training phase. 
we look at its out of sample prediction during this test phase and then we look at the treatment phase we're applying the treatment variable and we compare the difference between the actual and the counterfactual uh, data and then at the end we turn the experiment off and we see the system goes back to actual and predicted pretty much uh, coinciding. So here the causal impact is now the difference between the black line and the red line during the treatment period looks at what actually happened when you applied the treatment compared to what would have happened. These would have happened according to our model uh, if the treatment were not present. So this is a nice tool. We have a, another R package that does this. You can download it from CRAN and you can use that to uh, look at uh, causal inference of various sorts. Now, generally you want to have randomized experiments if you can, that would be the ideal situation, but randomized experiments are not always uh, possible, but there are cases where you can get what's called a natural experiment. You get some kind of randomization which is going on for free. And here are two uh, examples. One is, uh, uh, one is an example of measuring uh, class size on student performance. There's been a lot of debate about this over the years. Is it better to have small classes or big classes okay? Josh Angrist, an economist at MIT, uh, looked at a very interesting natural experiment in Israel. It turns out if you have uh, more than 40 students in a class, you have to divide it in two. That's the law. That's a requirement. So you could look at classes where there are 39 students in the class. You could look at situations where there are 40 students in the class, but that's the maximum number you can ever have. Any class bigger than that has to go down to roughly 20 students in uh, the classroom. So what's happening is you might assume that a class with 40 people really isn't that different than a class with 41. As soon as you have 41 people, you divide it in half, and you can now compare the performance between the 40-student class and the two 20-student classes. So that gives you a way of using a kind of randomization that's built into the uh, regulatory apparatus for these, uh, these students. We had a, another example of this. is a kind of nice uh, story about the Super Bowl. I imagine most of you have heard of the Super Bowl. It's a big football game of the year that determines the uh, national championships. And there are two interesting facts about the Super Bowl. One is it has, uh, a, uh, it has a situation where the ad sales are s typically sold out uh, a month or more before the game is actually held. So the advertisers are buying their slots in the Super Bowl very early. That's point one. Point two is the home cities of the teams that are participating see an elevated viewership. And this is true of almost every sports event. The home cities of the teams that are playing have about a 10 to 15 percent higher viewership than uh, your typical city. So put these two facts together. From the advertiser's point of view, they're paying their money for an ad, but they don't know where that ad is going to, uh, they don't know which teams are going to be participating in the game, so they don't know which places are going to have the extra lift that comes from being the home city of the fans, okay? So it's like you paid your money, two months later, two cities are chosen at random, those cities see 10% more ad impressions than the other cities. So it's virtually a natural experiment where you're randomizing over the choice of cities. You can compare your outcome variable for the impacted cities, the ones that have the extra ad impressions, to the cities that aren't impacted, and that gives you a way of measuring the causal impact of your advertising the outcome. So we did this using movie sales. There are typically about six movies advertised during the Super Bowl. And you could use the difference between the impacted cities, the cities that were the home cities of the teams that were playing versus the other cities, and get an idea of how ad spend uh, affected performance by using the randomization that came for free, essentially, from this experiment. The interesting thing is you can do this with virtually any sport. The Super Bowl is the cleanest example, but you could do it with any other sport because every sport has this home team effect that I was just describing. Okay, let me talk about my last uh,
topic, which was a contractual innovation, and think about a contract. What's the simplest contract you could imagine? Well, I'll do this if you do that. Just making a deal, making a, a trade of some sort. And the tricky thing comes in whether you can really observe the performance in the contract, because you can only contract on things that can actually be observed and could be uh, verifiable. So the um, nice thing is when you have a computer in the middle of the transaction, a computer-mediated transaction, then the computer can observe all sorts of things about that transaction that couldn't necessarily be observed uh, before. So I like to tell the story of uh, Abraham Lincoln, who was offered a hot beverage. And he took a sip of the beverage, and he said, Madam, if this is coffee, please bring me tea. If this is tea, please bring me coffee. <laughs> Problem there was the transaction could not easily be identified. Nowadays, we think it's easy enough to walk into a coffee shop and say, uh, if I give you $2, will you give me a latte? And then we can each verify, yes, he got the $2, yes, I got my latte, and everybody's happy. Think about advertising. I've given several examples. The old model of advertising was, pay me to show your ad, and people might come to your store, and they might buy your product. The new model is, you pay me to show your ad to some people, and you only have to pay me if they come to your store. That is, you only have to pay me if they click on your website. So you've got a different contract than you had before the computer mediation, because we can tell very easily if people came to your store, we just look at whether they clicked on your ad. You have your web log, you can see, yes, indeed, that ad was shown at this time. I click, uh, somebody clicked on the ad and came to my store. Everybody can verify details of that transaction, and that tra transaction leads to a more efficient uh, contract. So you've got a contract that was enabled by this computer mediation that wasn't really possible uh, before. And there are many other examples like that. Think about taking a taxi in a strange city. You don't know how the city's laid out, you don't know the driver, you don't know anything. The driver doesn't know you, they don't know if you'll pay, they don't know if you'll run out of the cab or rob them or do some uh, terrible thing. So it's a little iffy transaction. But now we put a computer in the middle. We have a computer that measures the route and shows you a map on your phone and says, yes indeed, you're going to get paid driver because I have this person's credit card number on file and you can verify they're taking the best route to the hotel because you can look at your map and the driver has a map. You see his rating, he sees your rating. It's a completely different kind of contractual relationship because the computer is there to observe aspects of the transaction and make sure that everything works out uh, uh, the way that people want it to work out. Another example, here's a thermostat. I've got a new thermostat. This thermostat will save your money on the bill. How do we know? Well, it's going to record all the times the furnace comes on. It's going to record the temperature inside. It records the temperature outside. And it can actually calculate the savings you have from using that particular device. So you don't have to take that claim on faith. The computer is actually recording the information as part of the transaction. And you're making a purchase that you feel much more confident about because of that computer mediation. You lease this car from me, and the, uh, you can have the car. You make your monthly payments. That's great. But if you don't make your payments for two or three months, I'm going to have to repossess the car. Okay? Pretty, un pretty standard transaction for leasing a car. Trouble is, repossessing a car, that's a very unpleasant, very unpleasant business because somebody has to go out and get in the car and drive it off and... You know, it may not be such a nice experience for any of the parties involved. So what do you do? Well, you put a computer in the midi middle of the transaction. The computer can verify, is this person paying the monthly lease payment? If they stop paying the lease payment, the, the car stops running. So you've got a computer that can enforce that contract because it can observe the aspects of the contract that were not previously easily observable. All right? And finally, what's my last example? Oh, yes, from the auto insurance business. 
you drive this car safely, I'll rent it to you. That's what it says in the contract at the rental agency, but of course, once you're out of sight around the block, it's not necessarily easy for them to observe, are you driving the car in a safe manner? Nowadays, what happens is, uh, I guess I'm here, I'm using the example of auto insurance, not the rental car, but the same claim ap applies there. Now you can download an app for your smartphone. The app actually measures your driving performance, how fast you're going, how far you're going, how quickly you stop, all these things. And then if you remain in the parameters of driving safely, you get a 15% discount on your rental car payments. So again, I would rather have that 15% discount and drive carefully, and the rental car agency would rather give me the 15% a discount as long as I drive the car safely. And so everybody can be made better off by providing that contract, but that contract can only be provided if you observe these aspects of the transaction that were previously unobservable. So this kind of contractual innovation, I think, is applying in lots of places where observability, monitoring, behavior is a problem in implementing an efficient transaction. Okay, so to summarize, with data extraction and analysis, you can use these searches available from Google. I should have explained those tools that I showed you were publicly available tools. The data could be downloaded from Google Trends. You can do exactly the same things that I did uh, on your own. You don't need any kind of special access. You can customize ads that differ with respect to the audience where it's served, emphasizing one aspect of your product in one place and a different aspect in a different place. You can do this kind of experimentation and continuous improvement by using uh, causal inference modeling, uh, the technique that I showed you earlier. And finally, as more and more things become observable, uh, through these computer-mediated uh, transactions, you can reach more efficient contracts and uh, improve the uh, overall welfare by increasing observability and increasing uh, contractual performance. So I think we'll stop there. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take questions. And we have some runners with the microphones, I think. Is that right? Absolutely. So uh, thank you very much for this very inspirational uh, talk. And I'm sure lots of our students will start downloading the Google Trends and trying to forecast stock prices and things like that <laughs> because they all want to get rich. Yes. Uh, but of course, there's many, many other applications, as you indicated, also um, to improve social welfare in general, I would say. Um, so uh, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, we have uh, time for like uh, 15 minutes questions. Over there, I see one question. Uh, raise your hands who want to. Yeah, over there is also another question. I'll give you this mic. to bring some dynamism in the discussion. Could you raise your hand so I see you? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, my question is what your model predicts if Trump is going to win in your <laughs> beloved country? You know, I'm, I'm uh, not really allowed to comment on that because we don't want any uh, charges of uh, you know, election interfering or insider information or any of those things, but you are completely welcome to go to Google Trends and look at the queries on Trump and Clinton and Johnson and uh, all these candidates, so. But your deep learning uh, division with the learning algorithms, can this uh, new newest technology not uh, assist us? So, it, it, there's sort of in theory and in practice, because in theory, you could be querying on candidates that you like or candidates that you dislike or candidates that are particularly interesting or did something newsworthy, newsworthy or uh, anything of that uh, sort. So there isn't a necessarily relationship between the uh, who you're querying, who you're searching on, and what your voting inclination is. In practice, it turns out that there is a relationship there, but, um, you know, 
just looking at the trends data is not uh, uh, particularly helpful in looking at the U.S. election because of the strange way that we use the Electoral College and all these other uh, sorts of things. So I would say uh, do it yourself, and I, I think you'll have fun looking at that data. But Thank you. There was another question over there. Yeah, um, here. Uh, I used to study here. I actually now work for Google oh. as an analyst. And um, working for Google, I get this question a lot, so I want to ask it to you now. <laughs> um, all of the examples that you've given where computers are mediators in yeah. data analysis or uh, processing are very positive for humanity and society. Yep. But do we also see potential negative impacts or potential risks that, and, and if so, how could we mitigate those? Yep. So indeed, there are risks, as with any technology. I, I just d mentioned that I uh, wasn't allowed to talk about Google's uh, predictions for the election outcome, and I, and I think for a pretty good reason, because people might try to manipulate those or might try to report things that favored their candidate, uh, uh, this sort of thing. So uh, it's not something that's, uh, that is uh, automatically can be used for uh, good outcomes, although I think there are many, many good outcomes that it can be used for. Like any technology, there would be misuses uh, as well, so. There's a question over here. Yeah. Thank you very much for uh, the interesting presentation. Many companies are currently looking at the blockchain and Ethereum and the like. Uh, what's your opinion uh, also in the frame of contractual innovation and the like? Yeah. Do you think yeah. blockchain is going to be very important and how do you see that actually and maybe Ethereum as well? Right. So um, the idea of smart contracts which are part of uh, which involve a blockchain and involve observing in a um, public way, let's say, whether or not a particular contract has been performed uh, is quite interesting because it automates some of the examples I gave here. Uh, but it's a separate issue from just the contractual innovation itself, which has to do with the observation of whether the conditions of the contract are met, whereas the blockchain technology and smart contracts usually deal with automating verification of the uh, of the contract which aren't exactly the same uh, thing I think these are very interesting uh, technologies uh, I do think there's issues involving uh, adverse selection as you know uh, people who want to have purely cash transactions uh, they don't want them to be traceable they don't necessarily want them to be revocable uh, that may involve activities that are potentially uh, criminal activities or activities where anonymity is very important. In other kinds of contracts, you want to be able to revoke the uh, contract if there's not performance. You want to be able to have a record of the transaction because it can be audited later on and so on. There's a role for both kinds of transactions. In some cases, you want cash-like transactions that have this anonymity. In other cases, you want these verified uh, transactions that prove the payment has been made from one party to another party. So there's room for all these uh, examples. More questions? Thank you so much for your lecture which has as the central team the mediation of computer in transactions. Uh, when you were giving the lecture, I felt some kind of optimism about how a computer can mediate lots of transactions. But my question is, does this overt mediation of computer in transactions not diminish the independent competencies, abilities, and skills? In a word, the relationship that could exist amongst people and between people in transactions? Uh, I don't think it diminishes it. I think it enhances it in the sense that uh, if two parties want to engage in a transaction and they want a way to verify that the performance of the contract is made uh, available, that's, that's up to them. Of course, you might decide that, no, I don't want to be monitored. I don't want the monitor to measure my 
uh, driving habits. So I don't want to uh, to have this kind of uh, observation or monitoring. But in many cases, it is something that people voluntarily choose to do. You think about uh, credit rating. So it is remarkable, I think, that you can walk into a new town where you know nobody and nobody knows you, you're a complete stranger in that town, walk into a bank and say, I'd like to borrow $200,000 for a house. And how can you do that? You can do that because you have a credit record, you have a rating, the bank can look at this, you can look at uh, your credit rating and the bank can decide whether or not they want to make a loan to you. So having that information that's publicly, well, uh, not publicly available, but having that information that's available to uh, qualified parties is extremely helpful in carrying out transactions that couldn't be carried out without that kind of, uh, of, uh, of information being available. So it's a case where it's up to you uh, whether you want to apply for that loan, but from the viewpoint of the person who's giving the, you, you the loan, they want to have verification, they want to have monitoring, they want to have all of these capabilities which can be enhanced by having this kind of computer mediation. So I think of these as, as enabling transactions that would otherwise not be enabled. Okay, one final question. This is the time, people. Oh. Over there. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, big data is increasingly also available to the states. Yep. To companies, large firms, to intelligence agencies, and in response there is an uh, increasing trend towards encryption, and a big debate also in the United States whether encryption should be allowed, and whether, for instance, intelligence agencies should be able to decrypt encrypted messages. Yep. Uh, I would like to hear the view of Google and yourself on this matter. Okay, I, don't, I can't give you the view of Google on this, but I can tell you one important point about encryption, which is just a technological point. Anybody can encrypt a message uh, themselves. I don't need an intermediate to do it. I can use my own program on my computer to encrypt a message. The debate is over whether a uh, third party can decrypt the message without the party's uh, agreement. But there's no real way to, to do that if the parties themselves are encrypting the message using their own tools. So it's a situation where it's, uh, it's certainly um, possible to overcome that uh, requirement of decryption if you engage in doing your own encryption. So it's not so clear that that would be helpful from a, uh, from a technological viewpoint. Okay, thank you. I saw one last hand in the back. So that's the final question. Good afternoon, and thank you for your lecture. Um, you know, what you have you know, presented today can apply, obviously, quite well in North America and, and Europe. You know, if you go to the uh, southern hemisphere and the, um, the less developed economies where less data is available, how can they, they leverage the same tools and technology to enhance their lives? So that is an excellent question, and I think that there have been very creative responses in some of these undeveloped countries or developing countries that utilize the technology that's available to them. For example, in PESA in Africa, which is a payment mechanism based on mobile phone charges, has really dramatically increased the capability of uh, financial transactions in these areas. And India is a leader in using um, identifiers, biometric identifiers, using retina scans that they uh, are enabling for the entire population of the country. 1.25 billion people will be able to verify their identity in a very low cost and very effective way. So I think we'll actually see a lot of innovation arising from that uh, capability alone. And I think that there's no reason why we couldn't see some very exciting mechanisms for economic transactions occurring in these uh, developing countries. Okay, thank you very much for your splendid lecture and the great question and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I would like now to pass on the floor to uh, Geert Noels, uh, the founder and chairman of uh, Econopolis, um, who uh, will uh, share with us his final remarks and reflections on this very nice uh, lecture that Professor Varian provided. Thank you, Geert. Thank you very much. Um, we should start with thanking everybody. Of course, first of all, Professor Varian, um, KU Leuven, Professor Konings, Dean Sels, uh, Urbain van Deurze, all the students present today, all the friends, and uh, this is the, the desk of uh, Professor Varian, and uh, it shows very well that he's an economist. Um, compared to the average, it's uh, above average. Um, and starting with uh, some of the, I would say, the um, closing remarks, um, Let's go back, because if you have read the book of uh, Professor Varian, you learn that, um, and that was a long time ago, one of the statements that you will find back is the, the Varian rule, which says that a simple way to forecast the future is to look at what rich people have today, and then in 10 years, the average will have the same. Now, if that rule holds to be true, then uh, it would be a very good thing that Donald Trump becomes president because then we all will have golden toilets. But I don't know if the rule still holds. Um, and we have, uh, of course, uh, gone further. It's not about um, this anymore. It's about technology. And what we have learned today about computer-mediated transactions, and I was changing it while you were uh, talking, um, because um, the personalized and, and, and personalization and customization which it enables is already changing our daily lives. Data extraction and analysis is becoming increasingly important. We've learned today also that uh, experimentation, and today we will say self-learning, is something that we will see in, in the future to, to unfold and to become even stronger. And of course, uh, you showed some uh, very innovation of contracts. So um, I think if we um, can learn these four things, it's already something. Often when we talk about technology, we become a little bit pessimistic and I don't think that's necessary. And you all in the room should play a role in telling to people that it's not a pessimistic message. It's a way in which we can improve our daily lives, we can improve the quality we can make things better. If we don't understand it, technology will be seen as an enemy and we have to do everything to learn to the people that, of course, there are certain threats, we have to manage them, but it's a way to improve our daily lives. Um, that's the optimistic message. There is the complexity, there is the opportunity. Um, one of the problems today is obesity. We, and this is a quote uh, by Halvarian, the new problem will be data obesity. Now there is a cure for data obesity. There are some uh, medicines for it. And um, there's an opportunity for the students in the room because to cure it, um, and it's also a quote by Hal Varian, is that the most sexy job will be statistician. Who is a statistician here in the room? One, two, three. Okay, four, five. So there's plenty of opportunity um, <laughs> to become more sexy. And if you want to really become sexy and rich, you have to move to Silicon Valley because there is a substantial difference in the pay between a statistician in, let's say, Belgium, New York, or in uh, Silicon Valley, as you can see. And it's always be better to be and sexy and rich, I guess. Um, Another thing is, um, while listening to uh, Professor Varian, of course, I was very curious about the trend, the, the, the query, Hal Varian itself. And this is the, the query, Hal Varian, on Google Trends. Now, what you can clearly see is that it remains very popular, but there is a clear spike. And the spike came when you came to Leuven. Um, this is not enough, of course. We were looking for other explaining variables. So I have been 
running uh, through the computer some things that might explain your popularity. Um, the thing that uh, correlated the best was in fact sexy statistician. And so uh, I think you have to elaborate further on that, perhaps use it as a title for your new book. But um, it's, it's, it's okay and I think the trend can still go up. That's the, the positive news. There is a lot of uh, positive things to tell about technology. Unfortunately, people are very afraid and we had some discussions this afternoon during lunch about the negatives. And uh, well, of course, people in Belgium have faced some negatives lately with uh, ING, but uh, it might not be over. And uh, we might have other TV and, and media attention about uh, closures, about new jobs that will be threatened, and so the opposition, I think, uh, will further grow. That's what we have seen today, and some have been uh, trying to explain that uh, this is wrong, this is, uh, well, this is in fact like something uh, of a bad uh, system, we should stop it. Now the chances that Belgium can stop technology are of course nihil, and if we want to do that, we can as well destroy all of our whole economy. So we have to explain much more and much better what is happening, and that's the reason why we have this chair, and why we have to also to be courageous. And this is a picture which is shown not only by me, but also by uh, Chief Economist Ivan van der Kloot, who is in the room, to say frequently that um, the facts are often more difficult to explain. Uh, and if you want to be popular, sometimes the road might be a bit less resistant, but in the long run, it's not what we should do. And it's not what should be done at uh, a university. At the university, we should be straight. We should tell and, and try to find the facts and explain them. We saw your desk at the start. This is a desk of a very famous scientist, uh, Einstein, who said, um, said something about a cluttered desk. And if a cluttered desk was a, a sign of everything, it was not um, a sign of a, a cluttered um, uh, idea. And so um, having such a, a desk still can bring some, some genius ideas. The problem is we are not all Einstein. And so although um, economists and statisticians have a bright future, we should also think about everybody else, jobs for non-Einsteins. And also the fact, uh, I mean, if, if people ask to economists which jobs have a, a good future, how is the economy going, uh, they will tell, well, we have seen this before. The, we have been before confronted with such revolutions and it always turned out well. The difference this time is that it goes very quickly. And in the past, it took one or two generations for the technology to unfold to its full speed or full strength. Now it appears to go faster and also we live some, somewhat longer. So the, uh, to adapt, it's sometimes uh, more difficult. So uh, apart from explaining what is happening, I think economists like uh, Professor Varian and myself, we should do also some efforts to, to find new uh, economic and societal uh, models. And so then the questions come about what are the ingredients of such a new model? And you are working a lot on these two, on, on how we calculate GDP, how we calculate productivity, uh, how we incorporate technolo technological innovation, etc. Uh, but these are, are the important questions that we should also tackle at this university, perhaps also in this share. Uh, we talked this afternoon ab also about more leisure. Uh, we come from a working week of 70 hours. We are now in the US at 40, in Belgium somewhat lower, to be honest. Um, should we value more uh, creative jobs? That's what you said this afternoon also. Um, lifelong education, new forms of education, I think also introducing more technology in the public sector, which is di still very difficult to discuss. There are some bright people in the room who can help us uh, with this. And thinking about also unfunded promises, because of a lot of the promises have been made on the basis of an old economy that would extrapolate into the future, and now we have a new economy which has a different model. So we have to think about these unfunded promises also. And instead of looking at the question marks, probably the solution is all of the above. That's uh, the end, and I think uh, 
above all, we have to keep, to keep in mind that the future starts with excellent education for all and using all talents that we have. And that's the mission that we should all carry. That's the reason why we start uh, with the cooperation that we are very proud to be a partner of KU Leuven. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Varian. And uh, thank you, KU Leuven, for having this opportunity. Thank you, Geert, for this uh, nice uh, menu of challenging questions at the end. I would also like to thank you and your team uh, and Turbijn van Deurze uh, for the uh, loyal collaboration and uh, partnership that we set up uh, about a year ago. And, uh, and it's important to kind of keep on stimulating partnerships, I believe, with the private sector uh, the new model of universities, I think, uh, and doing research is exactly that one. And uh, the KU Leuven is, I think, a forerunner uh, on that front. And so, uh, so we're very pleased uh, that we can learn also from people in the field. And so this uh, interchange between what we as academics do in the so-called ivory tower uh, or at, this, at these desks that you showed uh, we need uh, people in the field to kind of test our ideas and, and models. Uh, I would also like uh, to express my thanks again to Professor Varian, and you mentioned it already uh, at the start, uh, you thought it was a cake, ah, right? Yes. It's actually not a cake. You know, yeah. Belgium is known for two things in particular. That's beer, uh, we'll have some beers later on, okay. uh, and chocolates. So um, this is a small token of our appreciation uh, we really loved your talk, and I hope you will uh, visit uh, Belgium, and in particular Leuven, many years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> ah, my gosh. Even better. Thank you. And I would like to invite you now all to a reception, which is just next door. Ah. <laughs>